Um, my name is Taylor White and this is Brian Riley. Brian is from uh, Coltman and Page, the town's uh, legal counsel. Uh, with the new changes to open meeting law, which I'm sure you guys are thrilled to keep hearing about it from me. And I apologize for having to do that so often, but we want to make sure everybody's got the get on board. Uh, Kathy Cogshaw on the Board of Selectmen. And I decided to put this little uh, seminar on just so we could have everybody in one room. We could ask some questions, hopefully vet some of the issues. There, there are some major changes, and that's why uh, Brian is here today to go over them. He's done a PowerPoint slide. We're going to try to make it as quick as possible, but I want uh, any questions that arise. And Brian, I'm not sure if people, they want people to interrupt you or not. But um, Yeah, we'll, might as well take questions as we go. We that's just fine. want to dialogue and make sure everybody's on the same page with this, because um, <laughs> there are some new things, and they are going to affect different public bodies here in town and uh, we hope to protect ourselves by following these rules and uh, work together. So I appreciate you all coming today and with that Brian will let you get started and him and I are going to go back and forth a little bit as we move on forward. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much Taylor. Glad to see people here. I'm going to be slightly out of uniform. I'm going to leave my suit coat off just because it's kind of warm today. It's a beautiful day. Um, so I have been going around and, uh, and giving this uh, seminar to a lot of the, the uh, cities and towns that we represent. Uh, started My first one was back in January, and there was a, there was a rumor back in uh, May and June uh, that this was going to get put off for uh, a few months. Uh, but when the budget bill finally came out uh, of the legislature, that had disappeared. So it did, in fact, take effect uh, July 1. Um, so so there, are, there are a lot of changes. And uh, if, you've, if you've been on a board or you work with a board, uh, you're familiar with the basics of the open meeting law. And you know, in, in general, those are, are continuing, but there are a lot, of, a lot of the details have changed and gotten, gotten a, little more, a little more work, a little more complicated in some cases. But, um, but so what I'll do is uh, we'll go through the PowerPoint here. Um, I had three handouts, and one of them was a copy of all the slides here, so you can you know, read along with that uh, if you can't see the, the uh, screen. Um, and uh, definitely as we go, if you have questions, uh, I'll, I'll try to spot your hand and address them. I guess perhaps for the benefit of the camera, I'll, I'll probably repeat them. Uh, so why don't we start? Uh, so we're going to give an overview here. One of the uh, biggest changes is that uh, if you ever dealt with the uh, Barnstable uh, District Attorney's Office, the DAs were the ones that had authority over the open meeting law uh, before. And so uh, all the different counties around the state, you know, our, our office discovered occasionally that we'd get different answers to the same question from the DA's office. They read them a little differently. Um, so that's kind of a benefit is that this is now going to be under the uh, Attorney General's office. They've created a new division called the Division of Open Government. And they're going to oversee this as it applies to state agencies as well as to uh, city and town uh, boards. Um, some of the definitions have been changed, uh, some in important ways, and there's a lot of new requirements concerning uh, when you post your notice, what it looks like, where it gets posted, uh, what your minutes uh, uh, need to look like, a couple of changes on executive sessions, uh, and, and a few other uh, matters which we'll get to. And then lastly, I'll talk about the enforcement process. The Attorney General also has authority uh, to enforce uh, a lot more authority actually than the DAs ever did. A lot of times they would have to go to court if they wanted to get a really significant order against a, you know, against the board. Uh, the Attorney General has more administrative authority. Uh, so basically, the uh, these changes to the to the law were actually adopted a year ago, July 1, 2009, uh, the same time that they changed the uh, conflict of interest law. Um, you probably took the, uh, that little online sort of quiz uh, this year where we've been told by the AG there's no plans to do that for the open meeting law. So if nothing else, I'll give you that good news today. Uh, but they, uh, they put off uh, putting these into effect uh, for a year, basically to let the Attorney General's office try and get ready uh, to deal with it. So the, the old open meeting law in Chapter 39, Sections 23A, B, and C of the general laws have now been repealed, so those are gone. Uh, the new open meeting law is in Chapter 30A, uh, covering uh, Sections 18 to 25. And uh, I'll just say up front, I might say it uh, later on as well, that the, on the Attorney General's website, they ha now have a, a page uh, dedicated to the open meeting law, and you can find a lot of things there. There's going to be more and more advisories and regulations and things coming out. Uh, but they also have the text of these uh, statutes. 
Um, and the AG also has authority to adopt uh, formal regulations in the CMRs if your boards uh, deal with those. Uh, there's only a couple so far, uh, but there will be more. Uh, so first we'll talk about some of the definitions. Uh, the first one is uh, deliberation. So that's when a board, when your board is conducting a meeting and you have a back and forth, exchange of opinions and whatnot, uh, that's deliberation. An oral or written communication through any medium, including electronic mail, between or among a quorum of a public body on any public business within its jurisdiction. And then there's a few uh, express uh, exceptions uh, from that definition. So uh, one, one change that kind of jumps out is that they specifically include uh, written communication and even more specifically, uh, email. Uh, email, of course, gets more and more prevalence. Uh, it's a very handy way to exchange information, you know, send out agendas or uh, documents you're gonna be looking at. Um, but the, the district attorneys have actually been saying for quite a while, even though email wasn't referenced specifically in the definition before, that they considered if a quorum of a board was shooting opinions back and forth on s some matter that if they're gonna take up at the next meeting, that that really was improper deliberation. That's what's supposed to be happening in the room when the public has a chance to be there. Um, Brian, so, I just want to put, oh, sure. but that does not prohibit a, a chairman sending, like if there's a secretary and a chairman, Brian, of the chairman sending the agenda to the, the, the secretary, or the chairman sending it to the secretary for posting. That doesn't exclude that from occurring, correct? That's correct. Okay. That's just correct. make sure. Um, so, so basically, and the, the way the uh, Attorney General's office has, has said it, uh, I've heard the, this new director named Robert Nasdor say it a few times, is he really looks at if, it, if you're sort of exchanging opinions or details about uh, a matter that's coming up, that's the kind of thing which is supposed to happen at your meeting. And so you don't want to do that uh, in, in email or telephone calls and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, there are a couple of, of exceptions from the definition of deliberation. One is distributing a meeting agenda. So whether that's, uh, you know, whether that's by some kind of memo or by email, uh, if the chair puts the agenda together, sends it out to all the members, that's not considered deliberation. Uh, what you want to avoid, though, obviously, is, uh, is to then have the members start exchanging back and forth on what they think about the matters on the agenda. Um, scheduling information is also accepted. So, for example, a, a chair may realize that you're not going to have a quorum at your meeting scheduled for this Monday and want to find out what day later in the week members might be available. A little back and forth on that, that's considered strictly an administrative matter, um, so that's fine. Uh, and also uh, distributing other uh, you know, documents or, or reports, materials, photographs, articles, uh, anything that the, that the board uh, may want to deal with at the next meeting. Uh, that's perfectly fine. And of course, it's really easy to do that with email. Uh, again, you just want to not actually start discussing these amongst yourselves. Um, another thing that deliberation, just as in the former law, uh, deliberation on board matters requires a quorum. And so if you're a five-member board and two of you happen to be sort of writing back and forth on what you think about something, well, technically that's not deliberation. That's not a violation because there's not a quorum involved. Uh, the, the, the risk with that, uh, particularly with email, of course, is that, all, that if one member then forwards that email string to a third member, all of a sudden you do have a quorum involved. Uh, so you just need to keep that in the back of your mind anytime you're having, having an exchange. But uh, just like it was, was uh, with uh, telephone calls before, if two members happen to be talking on the phone, um, you know, that's not a violation until you send it on to a third or fourth member. Um, okay, so those are the things to remember about uh, deliberation. Uh, the term meeting, self-explanatory, a deliberation by a public body with respect to any matter within that body's jurisdiction. Uh, and then there are some uh, new exceptions, uh, some of which are, are very useful, I think. The first one, uh, and again, this is in the statutory definition of meeting. Uh, the first one is a carryover from the former law, which says that a, a quorum at an on-site inspection is not considered a meeting. Uh, so this is particularly useful for uh, the land use boards, uh, zoning, planning, conservation, board of health, that kind of thing. If you're, you're being asked to look at a permit application and you want to go see exactly what, you, what's on, what the land looks like, what you're being asked to uh, approve, um, you're, the whole board can go out and walk that site. 
and that's not considered a meeting and that's important because that means you don't have to post notice of it you don't have to take minutes and of course the public is not invited because you can't really invite the public onto somebody's private property um, so we do we got to asked occasionally whether in order to avoid a violation does all the board members have to walk around in complete silence uh, I don't think it's quite that extreme uh, there is, I don't see anything wrong with uh, with you as a board member asking uh, the applicant questions, getting information. Um, I think some minor discussion amongst yourselves uh, is okay. Uh, but just look at this, look at the on-site inspection as kind of a, a fact-finding mission. You know, get the information and then when you want to sit down and talk about whether, you know, whether now you might be in favor of the application or not, that's the discussion that needs to happen at your next meeting. Uh, attendance by a quorum at a conference or a training program or a media, social, or other event. This is uh, expanded from the old law, which just said a chance or social meeting. And so we actually did hear from some uh, district attorneys who said if, if, you're, if a quorum of your board was going to be at some training session like this, um, that they uh, thought, well, that wasn't a chance meeting and it wasn't a social meeting, so we think you ought to post that as a meeting. Always seemed a little over the top to me. But, uh, but now this is specifically not considered a meeting. So even if you know your whole board is going to be at something like this or uh, you know, somebody's retirement party, uh, anything like that, um, you don't have to worry about posting and taking minutes. Of course, you also shouldn't huddle in the corner and conduct business, but wouldn't expect you to do that anyway. Um, another exception is attendance by a quorum uh, of a board at a meeting of another board. So if, uh, if something's been filed with the zoning board, let's say, and it's a, it's a big project and a bunch of different boards uh, are interested in it. Um, it's all right for a quorum or even the entire board to come to the zoning board's hearing uh, and attend. Again, we occasionally heard otherwise from district attorneys, but now that's not considered a meeting. Uh, if you do that, you know, sit in the audience like anybody else. You can, you can obviously get up and, and make comments or ask questions. Uh, just don't do anything as a board while you're there. Uh, that this is different from, let's say, a joint, a joint meeting between two boards where both of you would have to post and take minutes. Uh, and then the last one, this is in the statute, but it's, it's a little odd, and the Attorney General is not quite sure what to do with this one yet either. Uh, so I'll, I'll, ra I'll raise it and then advise you not to really do it at this point. Uh, this was also accepted from the uh, definition of meeting is a meeting of a quasi-judicial board held for the sole purpose of making a decision in an adjudicatory proceeding. So there's some good, uh, good legalese in there. Uh, when a board is, is acting in a quasi-judicial manner, basically it means that it's, they're acting on something where they need to hold a hearing. They can't just make a decision themselves. They have to let other people uh, have the right to come uh, uh, talk and, and provide information. And then they're making a decision that affects someone's rights, personal or property rights. So the, the best example is any kind of permit, um, you know, variance, uh, any kind of license. These are all quasi-judicial matters. So, uh, so what this uh, exception seems to say is that a board could conduct a public hearing, hear everything they wanted to hear, uh, close it, and then get together the next day at somebody's house, talk about what their decision is going to be, make that decision, write it up, and show up at their next meeting with a written decision in hand, which pretty much flies in the face of everything else that this law stands for. Um, so we're not quite sure why this, why this made it through uh, the legislature, um, but the Attorney General is also concerned, also agrees that this is a little, you know, this is not something you really want to see happening all over the place uh, with, with boards making these decisions. So, um, so in, for the moment, anyway, I, I would say if you're a board that conducts hearings and makes decisions, keep doing it the way you have been. Uh, the AG will be issuing a regulation on this at some point, hopefully in the next few months, uh, to try and explain what they think this properly allows you to do and what things you should avoid. Uh, next term is, is uh, a governmental body, or now it's a public body. Uh, and it's a very broad definition. Uh, Multi-member board, commission, committee, or subcommittee uh, within any uh, uh, city, region, or town, however created, elected, appointed, or otherwise constituted, established to serve a public purpose. So that's very broad. Uh, provided further that a subcommittee shall include any multiple member body created to advise or make recommendations to a public body. We would occasionally get a, a question from uh, 
a board that had been appointed by you know, a public official or, or another board uh, to sort of a you know, short-term thing to study something and make a recommendation. Uh, and that board would feel they shouldn't be subject to the open meeting law because they really don't have authority to do anything. It's, it's all non-binding. Uh, but here, they, they've, they've specifically included uh, even a, a committee that's put together just to make a recommendation. So it is very broad. Uh, you know, I, I think I would assume that uh, if you're on a multi-member board, group, committee, whatever it might be called, um, that's you know, there to sort of do town business, you should con consider yourself subject to this law. Uh, there, there will be a few, uh, again, and you'll hear me keep saying this, uh, there, there are some sort of gaps in this law that the Attorney General is going to have to fill in for us. Uh, so we do think that uh, we will get some guidance on, on perhaps some very part-time um, or, or short-term uh, boards that may be uh, exempt from this definition. Uh, but they, it will be pretty narrow. Uh, the Attorney General has also has already said that uh, they would consider a, a department head meeting or staff meeting. Uh, some of the district attorneys felt that that should be covered by this law. Uh, the Attorney General fortunately does not agree because that's really not that's really not a board. Uh, parent teacher organization, you know, my, at first glance it might seem like they should be subject to it, but the AG uh, feels otherwise. Uh, the Republican or Democratic town committees, not considered uh, public bo boards. Uh, another one is um, any sort of uh, nonprofit corporation that's set up to kind of work with a, a town board, like uh, Friends of the Public Library, that kind of thing. Uh, they're not, that's not subject to the open meeting law. It's not a town, town body. Uh, it's a, really a private corporation. Uh, but mo any, any board that's uh, established by statute, by town bylaw, uh, you know, point to, uh, set up by town meeting. Uh, basically, you should consider yourself uh, subject to it. Uh, the other thing to remember is that it specifically says subcommittees. So if you have, let's say, a seven-member board and they want a small group to get together and study one particular matter issue and uh, make, come back and make a recommendation to the entire board, uh, that's going to be considered a subcommittee and the subcommittee itself is subject to the open meeting law. So even though the subcommittee may, may only have three out of the seven members, so it's not a quorum of the whole board, that subcommittee itself is going to be subject. So you would have to post your meetings, uh, take minutes, and all the rest. Uh, okay, we'll get into some of the sort of nuts and bolts uh, of the law. There have been a, a lot of changes to it, and some some of you won't like hearing, but uh, don't shoot the messenger, please. Um, so the first one is the notice. Uh, any any uh, board subject to this law, just like you had before, you're required to post notice of your meeting at least 48 hours ahead of time. Uh, but the old law, the only thing it actually required in that notice was the date, time, and place where your meeting was going to be. Uh, if you wanted to put anything else on it, that was fine, but the, the requirements were pretty bare bones. Uh, but now a notice must, in, uh, besides those three, uh, must include a listing of topics that the chair reasonably anticipates will be discussed at the meeting. So, f in other words, this basically is like your, the agenda uh, for your meeting. Um, so you need to, uh, the chair or whoever's putting the, uh, the notice together or the agenda for your meeting, uh, you do need to uh, make sure that that anything that you know is coming up, you know, a hearing on a particular application, maybe you're meeting with a, uh, you know, the DPW uh, director to talk about some issue, uh, whatever it might be, if, if you're expecting to reach that, there should be some reference in your, the meeting notice that actually gets posted uh, of all those matters. It doesn't have to be great detail, you know, little bullet points uh, are fine. Uh, you know, review draft bylaw concerning X, Y, and Z. Uh, it, all those, uh, that's fine, but that does have to be on the notice which gets uh, filed with the uh, town clerk's office uh, and then posted. Uh, the 48 hours rule, there's been a slight change in that. Um, it used to exclude Sundays and legal holidays. It now excludes Saturdays, Sundays, and legal holidays. So if you're a board that meets on Monday nights, it used to be okay as long as your notice was in by Friday afternoon. Well, that's not the case anymore. Uh, that would now have to be in by Thursday afternoon. Uh, it, 
if you meet later on in the week, this doesn't, you won't feel this difference. Brian, can I interrupt for one sec? Sure. One of the things that it's in the memo that I put out, um, the phrase the list of topics that the chair reasonably anticipates being discussed does not preclude other topics from, from being discussed that were unforeseen. So if, if something's not on the agenda, but it comes up, uh, you, you can't, you know, you wouldn't want to say, no, we can't talk about that. Uh, it, it, you are allowed to, but it's just the reasonable assumption is supposed to be posted on the agenda. So it doesn't, you won't have to stop your meeting and, and, you know, tell people to go away. You can continue to have your meeting, but it's just, again, this is just the disclosure portion of it. Right. That's a very good point. Yes. Just to go back to the subcommittee there. The chairman of the subcommittee will now be required to report to the chairman of the public body agendas, minutes. Those all all have to be forwarded on and posted in the town code. Uh, well, well, not posted, but but they are just like the full board. It was required to take minutes, and if they get filed with the clerk, then a a subcommittee would would be the same. That the subcommittee it has to be posted. The, the sub the, 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 the meeting of the subcommittee itself would have to be posted as well. That includes the agenda and the minutes of said meeting. Uh, well, the, the, they have to take minutes. Yeah, but the, but the posting that's right. You know, the subcommittee. You know, finance committee may have several subcommittees. They have to post notice of their meeting uh, of their meetings, and that also has to have a, a topic of expected uh, things they expect to get to uh, reach. What would constitute a quorum of that subcommittee if it's only maybe one or two people, just one person or two? Well, I mean, quorum generally is 50% is plus one. So if it's only two, I guess it probably takes both to be a quorum. But, but if it's three, then two out of three would be a, would be a quorum. But it, to answer your question, it would be the responsibility of the leader of that sub whatever subcommittee to post the notice with the agenda. Um, and then ultimately submit minutes in an appropriate time frame. Yeah, uh, but but uh, yeah, Taylor's point is very good. This re things that the chair reasonably anticipates will be reached should be on the notice. Uh, you know, if, if somebody gets up at your meeting and raises some issue and you really want to talk about it in depth, that's perfectly fine because you didn't you didn't see it coming. Uh, and then the, the the last change to the notice is that uh, in addition to uh, your uh, your meeting notice being filed with the clerk's office, it also has to be posted in a matter in a manner conspicuously visible to the public at all hours in or on the municipal building that houses the clerk's office. And this, we expect whoever put this in thought, well, this sounds like a great idea. More people can read these things. But it turned out to uh, cause all kinds of uh, uh, complaints. Uh, you know, a lot of town halls really just weren't set up to put up this kind of thing. Uh, you know if it's can it be off the building but a board in front of town hall you know how do how do you supposed to light it who's supposed to maintain it what happens when it snows oh, you know just a lot of things i can tell you the clerks along all on the commonwealth are just wringing their hands on this one it's just <laughs> it's um it's and so difficult. they they did well why don't i ask you what sandwich planning to do oh uh, we plan we plan on getting ourselves we're in the process waiting for the new fiscal year to come through to buy some scanning equipment so we're actually going to have a, a, a monitor hopefully anyone from historic here today no okay we're going to try to have a monitor in the town hall uh trying to facilitate the implementation of this thing is just it's just kind of you know we can't build a big uh you know 40 by 40 frame outside and put all the minutes on it so the best thing we've come to find out and other clerks are doing it is that we're going to put basically a, a monitor with a uh, powerpoint presentation with all the different agendas and meeting notices running constantly so they will be visible from out from they will be inside the building but looking through the window you'll be able to see it and according to um, the attorney general's office that would be uh, acceptable that's what most a lot of clerks are going that way with it do you have a question david well it seems to me that's now, the, that's a that's a good point. Brian can talk about that. Yeah, the uh, the the, uh, the statute did say that the attorney general has the authority to approve alternative means if you can't do this, you know, posting it in or or on uh, the town hall. Um, and so they have actually issued a regulation on it. The the um, they certainly they obviously got the suggestion. Well, if we put it on the internet, that's 24 hours a day. Uh, but they were, their, their concern about just allowing, accepting that as the uh, alternative is that while, while obviously most people have access to that now, not everybody, you know, some, some uh, segments of society have less than others, you know, senior citizens perhaps. Um, so they just felt that that wasn't 
quite enough to comply with this, with, with having it available 24 hours a day to everybody. So they said, well, if you put it on the internet and also have it in some other town building that would be accessible at all hours, like the lobby of the police station or something like that. Same with cable television. They didn't, they didn't want to just allow that as the 24-hour requirement. My office has windows. Like I said, we're trying to work, we're trying to figure it out. It's a work in progress. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Frank. Frank, are you talking about this one here? Okay, no, this this was merely, uh, purely, and this is what I put together. This isn't what town council, but this is based upon the law. And if you don't mind, Brad, I'm gonna talk about this real quick while we're yeah, talking about notices. Time, yeah. For everyone who has that, I have a uh, four or five page memo that has been going around email for the last couple of weeks. Uh, the fourth page is uh, meeting notice. This is purely an example. Uh, the only items that need to be on here is the name of the public body which you see at the top uh, location date and time which is there um, I use the planning development office ladies for the example um, the agenda it was just pledge of allegiance uh, chairman's comment this is just this is just my throwing in several things a thing new business old business all of those things can be discussed frankly anything can be discussed this was just an example of how we're gonna have it laid out from now on No, th this. Yeah, this mm -hmm. is just an example. You, you should put new old old business, whatever you want to put on as long as it's posted. Again, this is this is not how it should be laid. This isn't the items I have on here are not what you're required to do, and I'm not excluding anything or including anything. It's just merely an example. It depends. It, de it de No, because I mean, uh, public bodies all the time are having uh, 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 public hearings and they make a decision afterwards. So that's that's fine. Some public bodies continue hearings, uh, like, like for like the zoning, uh, the planning development office. Those meetings sometimes go on for weeks and in fact months because there's different things going on and those are continued. Yeah, you can absolutely talk about new business, have a public hearing, public body, make a decision at that night. That's, you can definitely do that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Melinda, I'll go back to you, Frank, in a sec. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, is this gonna be a template somewhere so that you can go online and pick it up? This, this so has been- Can we do it by email because- Yeah, I've, I have emailed this to pretty much everybody. I, if anybody okay. doesn't have this, Today, um, see me and I will have it emailed to you by the end of the day, but this is floating around and this is the template that we will be using for all public bodies in town. Um, and can we email it back to you? No. Unfortunately, and I think David, you made this point earlier, this, this open meeting law, the new regulations, it's actually, when it comes to the use of technology, it's sort of taking kind of, it's a step backwards uh, because you're not allowed to use the internet and, and faxes and those types of things, which you know I, I'm certainly not too big on. But again, it's not. I didn't make this up. This is the uh, legislature's doing, and so they, we've sort of had to take a back seat. So I can definitely get this to you via email, and anyone else who doesn't have it, especially chairman and secretaries of boards, to use this. In my office, I need two copies of this signed originals. And again, I know it's more work. I'm not the one doing this. This is the state doing this. But we need to be able to get these signed originals in my office 48, at least 48 hours prior to the meeting. So not only do we post them, but as we were just talking about, I have requirements and I'm now required to post these 48 hours in advance. So it helps me do my job in fulfilling that requirement uh, for the town. Frank? Yeah. Uh, going back Saying, Brian, that you cannot in fact use email to ask 
or did you or even provide an opinion on that? And follow-up question to that would be on draft minutes. Many committees send out draft minutes, and you're saying now we can't send out draft minutes for correction prior to those things have to be discussed at the next meeting. Could you just comment on that? Yeah, well, a, a couple of things. First about um, if, if somebody has a question afterwards, uh, you know, Again, the Attorney General thinks that, you know, at any time you're exchanging opinions, um, that's the kind of thing that needs to be in a public session so the public has, is able to at least. Let's limit it to not opinions. But okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, you know, it, it's, um, it's kind of a slippery slope, perhaps, or whatever the expression I'm looking for is. Um, you know, it seems to me that, that if a board is having a discussion at their meeting, and there's, there's one issue which people aren't quite sure what the answer is and it's left kind of unresolved. Seems to me that if the next day one member finds you know, an article or something that, that's relevant or has the answer and they say, look, I found this, you know, I think this addresses that question that we had last night, sends it off, I think that's perfectly fine. That's really just exchanging you know, reports and documents and whatnot. What you don't want is to have all the members writing back saying, oh, well, in that case, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be opposed to that. You know what I mean? So that's the kind of, that's the kind of uh, distinction that you need to be uh, aware of. The draft minutes, uh, yeah, this, is, this has come up before. Um, I know it's really handy to uh, you know, send out draft minutes and get all the comments back. Um, I'm, I'm not quite, I don't think the Attorney General is going to be crazy about that. Uh, because it's it, it is more the substance of, of the board's business uh, to you know correct correct draft minutes and approve the final one. Um, it it may be that we get a regulation or an advisory from this office that says just hypothetically you know if it goes out to all the members and each member sends in their own corrections to you know the secretary then maybe that's okay but we can't have back and forth. Yeah, I'm just not quite sure yet. Uh, but I'm, I, I, I can't really say yes. You know, do do the corrections. You know, over over email is fine because that is a substantive matter that the that the uh, part it's part of the board's business. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you on the example you gave of sending the article the day after, but I'm wondering about the cover comment that you make. I think this answers the question. <coughs> to me on, it, on an opinion that may or may not be permissible. That's, that's true. <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, you know, like I say, there's, if there's kind of a, there's a lot of gray, uh, you know, o over something like that. Uh, but I think if, if it's a, you know, if it's a one-way exchange of information and it doesn't lead to a conversation, shall we say, even electronic, uh, I think in general that's going to be okay. It's sort of the serial back and forth that you definitely don't want to do. Brian was nice enough to come to the clerk's conference and uh, all, the, all the town clerks, there were probably about 100 of them in the room at the time and they're all asking Brian these questions as well and, and some of the questions just don't have answers unfortunately. The way the legislation was written and the way the Attorney General's office is promulgating regulations based upon the legislation, it does leave uh, some areas that are undefined and you know we're trying to I mean our, our town council is great they've been in contact with the AG's office to get answers yeah. to these questions I know the clerks association is also trying to get these answers too so there are some gray areas as you said and we're you know we're trying to work through and make them more concrete and um, do the best we can so please please know that we don't have all the answers for you but we're trying to do our we're best working on it. <laughs> okay um, okay well, we'll talk about minutes which we touched on already um, uh, boards always have to take minutes, uh, and, and when those minutes are finalized, those become a permanent record. Uh, on this, as a public records law issue, certain records you can dispose of after a period of time, anywhere from a few months to several years, uh, but, uh, but meeting minutes are always a permanent record, so they always have to be kept. Um, but the, the, uh, again, the, the old open meeting law didn't say a great deal on what was supposed to be in those minutes. It's supposed to be an accurate record of, of what happened at the meeting. So there's a little more detail now in, in, this, uh, in this new law. Uh, the minutes, in addition to the obvious ones, you know, saying when and where this meeting was, what, what members were there, um, it should include a summary of the discussion of each subject that came up. Uh, so sort of following through your agenda, 
Uh, it certainly does not mean you need a, a transcript. You don't need to say, you know, member A said this, member B responded by saying that. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to see a half hour discussion summarized in one sentence either. Uh, just a, a summary of, of the, whatever the board did uh, on, on each matter. Um, any uh, decisions the board makes or actions that they vote to take should be in there. Uh, a record of all votes should be in the minutes. Uh, there is no change on the use of um, roll call votes. That's uh, just like before, those are only required if the board's voting to go into executive session or if they're in executive session, all votes have to be by roll call. Uh, but otherwise, uh, a, a, you know, a listing of what the motion was and that the board approved it five to zero, that's, that's a perfectly good record of the vote. Uh, the minutes now shall include a list of documents and other exhibits used by the body at the meeting. Uh, so in addition to the summary of each matter, uh, somewhere in the minutes is supposed to be a, a, a list or some little identification of each uh, um, record or document uh, that was used, that the board used at its meeting. And then the, uh, this section also states that the, uh, the documents and other exhibits that are used by the board shall, in addition to the minutes, uh, be part of the official record of that meeting. So this is, an, this is another issue uh, that the, the way it was worded has raised a lot of questions and concerns. Uh, first of all, it seems as though the board has to keep a, you know, careful track of, of any kind of document or record that it used at its meeting and store it someplace. So that's li liable to create a need for more file cabinets. Um, it, it wasn't entirely clear whether you were supposed to keep all these documents with your minutes, um, but the, the Attorney General has at least offered that the, the, the documents from the meeting and the minutes themselves are two different things. Uh, so when the minutes get approved, they need to be stored however they're stored, if they're filed with the clerk's office or if the board keeps a, a copy as well. Um, and the minutes are going to have this list of the documents that were used. Uh, but they don't necessarily have to be kept together. I, th I think the intent of this, the listing of the documents is just so if somebody reads the minutes six months down the road and wants to now take a look at what records the board used that night, they'll have some, a little sort of roadmap on what documents to ask for. Um, I'm gonna put a real yeah. quick sign. On the, the memo that I put out in minutes, um, uh, I'm gonna send this out again. I'm just going to make sure, because I, I put in there that it has to contain the uh, the documents that were submitted, but I didn't put it in there a list of them, so I don't want people to perceive that mm -hmm. being you have to bring me a whole huge stack of stuff that was used during the the meeting. But I'm just going to further define that in the the, uh, the memo that I sent out, which is basically a summary of what Brian's giving today. Mm -hmm. uh, the only other thing I wanted to mention too um, is that emailed and faxed minutes are no are no longer going to be accepted. I'd say usually about 75% of the different public bodies send me hard copy signed minutes and um, there was a small population of those who sent me either faxes or emails. We're not going to accept those. As a matter of good public policy, you need original signed minutes and from there because if I get emailed or faxed copies, then you know I'm emailing or I'm faxed, I'm copying them, I'm faxing them and the quality of it's getting distorted. So what I need to have in my office are original signed minutes to be filed. Um, in perpetuity. So I just want to point that out, and that's in the memo as well. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes, Reg. Um, I don't want me to jump ahead too much, but basically, it's about a month. Uh, we, 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 there are certain boards that uh, I haven't gotten minutes in for years. Other ones send me them every week. I mean, it's it's pretty. It's kind of all over the place. We want to get down to a consistency. Um, where the minutes are, are, are in a timely manner. Actually, Sandwich Town bylaws uh, have also been adopted to this effect where they, they ask in our bylaws, not only the state law, but our bylaws saying get them to the clerk's office in a timely manner. I think a month is reasonable, I and mean, I'm not going to be running around. I have better things to do than run around and, and knock on people's doors for minutes, but I would just be asked that you as members of public bodies try to get them as soon as possible. Some boards don't meet that frequently, uh, so if that's the case, then you need to approve the minutes, and that's fine. Uh, there is one, uh, which is also in my memo, that um, 
unapproved minutes, if a member of the public wants to see unapproved minutes, uh, they will be able to do that 10 days after a meeting. So that's not something, they, they can come directly to the public body and ask for that. So just be aware that 10 days after a meeting, if a member of the public wants to see, and that's a new requirement, I believe, right, Brian? Um, well, not, not in terms of the, the public records law. Okay, that's, it's, uh, can, all right, I wasn't yeah, sure. It, but that allows, so that allows anybody to knock on your door 10 days afterwards and say, I want to see your, your un, undraft or your draft minutes. So yeah, well, once, just be aware of it. Once the minutes have been approved and you have a final version, if nobody has asked for the drafts, uh, you can get rid of them. Uh, but, but they are considered a public record. If, so if somebody asks for your draft minutes and you have them or you, you haven't finalized them anyway, um, they are entitled to get a, a copy of that. That's as a matter of the public records law. Um, let's see. Oh, just one, one more thing about the, the documents that a board uses. Uh, we, we do certainly expect uh, some more guidance from the Attorney General on this because uh, another question this raises is if, uh, if somebody comes to the, you know, whether it's an applicant or a member of the audience, uh, comes in and they've got some photographs they want the board to look at or they've got a, a big three by three foot you know, map that's blown up. Uh, does that mean the board is supposed to keep that if they used it at the meeting? Um, but the, we hope anyway, the Attorney General is gonna, use, is gonna you know, have a little common sense interpretation there that if, it, if it's something that somebody brings in and wants the board to use but they really didn't intend to file it with the town, um, that that's, it's, their, it's their record and, and they should be able to keep it and the board should not be responsible for having to go out and get a copy of that kind of thing. But certainly anything that's really filed with the board uh, is going need to be, need to be kept. Did, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm hoping you give me the answer I want on the documents <laughs> and the exhibit shoes. Uh, many of these public bodies, I know like mine in particular, we're looking at things like the local comprehensive plan, bylaws, huge documents from the Cape Cod Commission that we're digesting. Please tell me I don't have to send them to Taylor every time we have a meeting and use these documents. That's, that's not no, right. I, I, you don't have to send it to me anyway, but. I, <laughs> uh, well, hey, because it says that's included in the minutes. So when I walk down to yeah. the office and say, here's the minutes, do I have to have the, I mean, it's just. Uh, it's you, not you don't. No. Okay. First, the. But the you also send the documents and others if it's used, not just a list. Right. The, 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 uh, the documents that the board used, this is what the statute says, are considered part of the official record of, of the meeting, which means they, they have to be kept. But. Uh, that raises kind of two points. One, if you've got some document that you're referring to, you know, eight meetings in a row, uh, I think it's silly to think that you need eight, eight copies of it, you know, one for each folder uh, representing each meeting that you had. Uh, you know, you refer to it, and it, if it's the town zoning bylaw, you know, that doesn't change very often. So, uh, you know, if you refer to it, I think that's fine. Um, the, the other issue, and this, the, the Attorney General, um, what we certainly advised, you know, this office uh, of this issue is that, you know, let's say the Finance Committee that meets all, all spring, uh, winter and spring, and you go through 12, 15 different versions of the town budget document, so you have to keep all 15 of those, you know, again, seems a little overkill. Um, uh, the, the way the statute reads, it kind of suggests like you do, but, uh, but the AG understands, you know, that that might be a little absurd. So we, we are hoping to get some, some uh, guidance and, and relief on that issue, we hope. And Sean, just, just to answer your question, I don't, my, my office, the clerk's office, does not need the documents themselves. Um, if there are a, a, a small set of documents that it's in a public hearing, that is housed by the public body. I just need the minutes and the the minutes of the meeting and it can contain within that a list of those documents used. So I'm not, yeah, okay. Frank? Yeah. Uh, just, that's my next slide. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question in the back, yeah. Kathy. Oh. Uh, so they're they're giving they're giving the board the document. Yeah, well, 
I mean, I, I think that if, uh, I think the statute is saying that if the, if the board, you know, accepts that and it's, and has any kind of discussion on it, then I think it's considered a record of the meeting and should be kept. Yeah, I, I see. Um, boy, that's kind of a between the gaps one there. Uh, it's, you know, technically if the board wasn't discussing it, then, uh, then it probably doesn't fall under this. Um, so, yeah, it's arguably at least you don't have to keep that. Um, well, you, you don't need to do that. I mean, the, the, the minutes are of the, of the, you know, the actions and the discussion of the board, um, really. You, you so. could probably summarize that, you know, Joe Schmo talked about this issue. I think that would, I don't know, mm -hmm. yeah. be acceptable. Yep. Yeah, one additional question about this must include this down at the bottom, the documents and other exhibits used. Now, suppose that some exhibits don't exist in hard copy form, that they're in electronic form. For example, if you had not brought handouts mm -hmm. and distributed your slides, they would be only in electronic form. How is it, does that obligate anybody making a presentation in electronic form to provide handouts? What is, what is that? No, I, I don't think so. And, and I think that's also, um, particularly if an applicant or somebody in the audience, you know, has some PowerPoint or something, uh, that's kind of the same as if they brought a big map. You know, that's, that's not considered the board's records. Um, there, are, there are a lot of issues about, you know, electronic storage, can we leave documents in electronic form? Uh, and the, the public records office is completely different, that's under the Secretary of State. Um, are, uh, we're told, you know, working on kind of updating their, what, what they accept for, um, you know, long-term storage on electronic records. So hopefully we'll be getting those one of these days as well. I think this was brought up at the clerk's conference too. What if somebody brings in a huge model? Do we have to keep that? I think the yeah. best thing to do would just be, just try to be reasonable about it. If, you, if it's easy enough for you to take and, and, and store, try it. You know, um, don't go killing yourselves trying to get every little piece of paper, but just try to do your due diligence the best you can in fulfilling it. I think, you know, at least, it's not legal advice, but it's just saying, just try to do the best you can. We know it's, we know this is a, kind of a gray area, um, but don't bring any huge models back with there. You don't need to do that. <laughs> right. All right. There you go. Let me move on. Um, oh, this, I'm not going to spend too much time on this one. The, the important thing here is that, um, again, under a matter of, the, of public records law, the minutes of any open session, um, with very rare exceptions are going to be considered um, uh, public records. And so that's, that's kind of obvious. It was, a, it was a meeting that you held where the public could come attend anyway, so you're not going to be talking about you know, confidential matters that you would do in executive session. Um, they did uh, throw this in there that certain, uh, certain documents, which, uh, which I guess the way they, they phrased this is that if they were used in an open meeting, you still might be able to keep them exempt as personnel materials. Uh, documents used in a performance evaluation of, of a public official, for example, that were not created by the members of the board that are conducting that uh, evaluation, or uh, matters uh, concerning about uh, employment, you know, a, a screening committee, for example, that was uh, interviewing people and getting documents in, uh, not including resumes, those are considered public records, but other things uh, uh, could be exempt. Uh, executive sessions. Uh, if you're a board that has ever used the executive session, this is uh, the, the limited times when a board can go meet uh, behind closed doors and, and keep the public out. Um, the old law had 10 different purposes uh, that were, that were the, the, the only valid ones for doing that. Uh, those 10 haven't changed. They took the first three and kind of shuffled them a little bit, uh, but basically the wording is exactly the same. Um, and you do uh, also have to keep minutes of your executive session, uh, but the general rule is that as long as the, the purpose of your executive session was ongoing, let's say you had some ongoing litigation and it went on for you know, a year and a half, uh, the minutes of those sessions could be withheld um, from anyone making a request, uh, as long as the purpose is going on. But when the purpose of the session has been concluded, then a board really is supposed to go back 
finalize their minutes, approve them, and then they become a public record. Uh, unless they have some kind of you know, personnel issue or, or personal privacy issue in there. Uh, but the general rule is they become public record at that time. Uh, as Taylor mentioned, you know, some, some boards do better at this than others. Uh, it's actually kind of easy when an executive session matter is done and you haven't looked at these minutes in 10 months to forget to go back and finalize them. Uh, so the law has now built in this kind of housekeeping method to, uh, to, to get the minutes uh, finalized. Uh, it says that the, that the body or the chair or someone designated uh, by the body should uh, periodically go back and review executive session records. So I think the phrase they use is at reasonable intervals, whatever that might mean, every few months, I suppose. Um, and if, it's, if, uh, if the, set, the, uh, the purpose for the session is now done, then the board really should finalize those minutes uh, and they become, uh, they become available to the public. Uh, if somebody makes a request for executive session minutes, uh, the board has 10 days to respond, just like the public records law says. Uh, and that response can be, um, uh, no, this matter is ongoing, so it's, we're, it's exempt from disclosure. Uh, it might be, you know, yes, we have these, we'll, we'll make them available at the next meeting. Um, if, the, uh, if the board hasn't done this periodic review, uh, then they have until their next meeting or 30 days, whichever is less, uh, to, to go back and look and, and, and figure out whether this is an ongoing matter or whether, in fact, it is done. Uh, so basically, this is just built in to try to get boards not to uh, forget to go back and, and finalize the, uh, these uh, minutes. But as long as the matter is ongoing, it's still exempt from disclosure. It's uh, so another new uh, re uh, requirement under executive sessions is that in addition to uh, you know, taking, moving and taking the vote, you have to specify which of those 10 reasons you're using. The statute also says that the chair must state all subjects that may be revealed without compromising the purpose for which the executive session was called. We really don't know quite what to do, what to tell people about this one. Um, because uh, there's definitely not gonna be a bright line test on this because for example, if uh, you've got a, an ongoing piece of litigation and uh, you want to meet and talk about some new, new development or new propo you know, settlement proposal, whatever it might be, um, obviously you need to say we're going into executive session to discuss uh, pending litigation strategy, strategy for pending litigation. Uh, if you, if you looking at this, if you also say the name of the case you're going in on, well, I, I can certainly picture cases where that in, in, by itself is sort of tipping your hand. Um, so, kind of been telling people, we, we don't think uh, the, there's going to be real hard and fast rules on this. Uh, you definitely don't want to say, going into executive session for purpose number three and, the, and, and go off. And, you know, do, you at, least, uh, at least specify within that purpose, whether it's for a collective bargaining strategy, litigation strategy, uh, to talk about the value of uh, real property, you know, the town you know, might be looking to purchase. Uh, you have to say that much, um, but I don't. I don't really think you need to, uh, you know, say say a great deal more. I, I don't think this necessarily changes what the rule was before. Um, you know, again, this is all part of this sort of make things more transparent. Uh, but you need to kind of think about what you're saying as your purpose uh, before you go in, because because you you don't have to you don't have to tip your hand. That's the whole point of having this session in the first place. Uh, so a couple of the uh, the these 10 purposes, the ones that get used a lot. Um, the first one, uh, to discuss the reputation, character, or physical condition, or mental health, rather than professional competence of an individual, or uh, sort of labor matters, to discuss the discipline or dismissal, or hear complaints or charges brought against a public uh, official or employee. Um, just as under the old law, if you were gonna use this purpose, you have to give a written notice to the individual you're gonna talk about. Uh, let them know that they can attend. They can actually insist that it happen in an open session if they want to. Uh, they're allowed to bring legal counsel along. They're allowed to, uh, you know, address the board, represent themselves. Uh, then there's a new right, which has been uh, that the individual is also allowed to create their own record of the executive session. Uh, the statute says uh, audio recording or a transcript, which I think means they could bring a stenographer in. Uh, conceivably, that would happen with a, a labor issue. Um, but uh, if, you're a if you are a, a board conducting this kind of session and someone brings in a tape recorder, 
um, they're allowed to do that, and it's their record. So you can't, uh, you can't require that they give you a copy, and uh, you can't really tell them what they can do with it when they leave, because uh, it is their own record. Uh, so that, that is a new, uh, a new right for individuals under this, uh, this exception. Uh, a couple others that get used all the time. Uh, strategy sessions to prepare for negotiating with non-union personnel, uh, or actually conducting collective bargaining or negotiations with non-union personnel. And then the other one is a strategy for collective bargaining or litigation. And it says, if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares. Uh, so there are a couple of sections uh, with these purposes where they've thrown in this, this uh, requirement that the chair actually say this before they move into executive session. Um, that we're, we're doing this in executive session because if it was open session, it would be detrimental to the town's position, something along those lines. Uh, this one about uh, strategy for, for collective bargaining or litigation, uh, to uh, consider buying or selling uh, real property. The chair is supposed to say we're doing this because if we did it in open, it would be detrimental. Uh, the other one is the uh, screening committee who's interviewing people to fill a, fill a town office. Um, so we're, there's a bunch of new things that the chair is supposed to announce during these meetings. Uh, so we're, we're actually going to try to come up with a little sort of script uh, to help uh, keep track of all these. Uh, a few other administrative matters which I'll reference. Um, under the, the previous law, every once in a while somebody would ask, you know, we, we're holding a meeting and a member who we really need to participate you know, is on vacation or they're, they're sick at home or they're in the hospital or something, can't we have them call in by, um, by speakerphone and participate? Uh, pretty much across the board, the district attorney said no. The way, the way meeting is defined, uh, the body ha you know, your body has to be in the room. Uh, the new law says that the attorney general may authorize remote participation uh, provided that a